Steve Pinker needs no introduction to this audience, nor to any other audience for that matter. He is Harvard College professor and the Johnstone Family Professor of psychology, in Psychology. Uh, before coming to Harvard, he taught at MIT in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. His research has been on the topics of visual cognition and on language, and he's renowned for his popular books such as The Language Instinct, How the Mind Works, The Blank Slate, The Stuff of Thought, and most recently, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. Steve is a valued colleague, uh, having selflessly taught the introductory psychology course uh, called The Human Mind to hundreds of, uh, hundreds of concentrators, for which as head tutor in psychology, I am very grateful. Um, today he will talk about that which he does so brilliantly. He will talk to us about writing. Thank you, Mazarin. <clears throat> Few of us have any illusions that students will long retain the content of the subject matter that we teach, but many of us take comfort in the idea that students will come away from a university education with some basic uh, intellectual skills. Foremost among them is the ability to write. Competence in writing skill is uh, among the signature accomplishments of a university education, and exit surveys and polls of employers show that this is among the skills that are most high, are considered to be the value added by a university education. Nonetheless, there are a number of reasons to suspect that we are not succeeding at this task, and I will uh, share my own experience of grading papers from some of the graduates of our elite universities who end up in the uh, Harvard graduate program in psychology. All of you who graded papers uh, are familiar with verbiage such as, object affordances defined by shape and manipulability provide, provide cues such that humans do not require much time experimenting with an object in order to discover how it functions, which is a fancy way of saying people sometimes know how to use a tool just by looking at it. <laughs> it may be that some missing genes are more contributive to the spatial uh, deficit. If adoptive siblings are more closely related than random pairs of people not raised together, then an important effect of shared environment would be suggested. <laughs> now, we're all uh, familiar uh, from wading through this kind of sludge from our uh, students, indeed, sometimes from our colleagues, that instruction in writing uh, could use some improvement. Well, how is writing taught in universities today? Uh, for many of us, when we think of writing instruction, the first image that comes to mind is the following. Uh, the classic style manual, The Elements of Style, by uh, two dead white males, uh, William <laughs> Strunk, Jr., the professor of Cornell, born in 1869, and his uh, former student, the beloved author of Charlotte's Web and New Yorker, columnist uh, E.B. White. Now, uh, there is good reason for the popularity of the elements of style. It's the most popular style manual in use in universities today, having sold 10 million copies. And, I, and in many, I don't mean to pick on this manual, but I think it is emblematic of many of the ways in which writing uh, is taught today. Uh, and indeed, there is much to admire about the elements of style. Its prime directive, omit needless words, is an excellent example of itself and is uh, timeless advice. Uh, and moreover, is introduced with considerable charm and indeed writing skill. As E.B. White reflects on his old professor at uh, Cornell, whose course notes he adapted into the elements of style, Wright wrote, in the days when I was sitting in his class, he omitted so many needless words and omitted them so forcibly and with such eagerness and obvious relish that he often seemed in the position of having short shortchanged himself, a man left with nothing more to say yet with time to fill. <laughs> Will Strunk got out of this predicament by a simple trick. He uttered every sentence three, three times. When he delivered his oration on brevity to the class, he leaned forward over his desk, grasped his coat lapels in his hands, and in a husky conspiratorial voice said, Rule 17, omit needless words, omit needless words, omit needless words. 
Nonetheless, for all its uh, charm and good sense, I think there are many reasons to think that the elements of style and similar approaches should not be the basis of writing instruction in the 21st century. Let me just give you some examples of the kind of advice that we teach our, that students are taught today from elements of style and similar manuals. So you, there are, these books will often contain a list of words and expressions commonly misused. Strunk and White tell us, for example, that the word people is not to be used with words of number in place of persons. That's, that is, seven people is a grievous grammatical error. Why? Well, if of six people, five went away, how many people would be left? Now, don't bother trying to understand the logic there. <laughs> Trust me, it makes no sense. <laughs> the verb to contact, which was uh, a vogue word when uh, E.B. White was a young man in the 1920s, uh, is vague and self-important. Do not contact people. Get in touch with them, look them up, phone them, find them, or meet them. Uh, not, not only, of course, is the verb to contact now completely unexceptionable, but there's a good reason that it's unexceptionable. Namely, there's sometimes when you really don't care about how one person is going to be in touch with someone else. For that matter, they can email them, they can instant message them, they can tweet, uh, and so on. The verb contact is actually quite uh, handy for that purpose. Or on clever, note that the word means one thing when applied to people, another when applied to horses. <laughs> A clever horse is a good-natured one, not an ingenious one. Huh? A second example, keep related words together, which they uh, summarize by the guideline. The subject of a sentence and the principal verb should not, as a rule, be separated by a phrase or clause that can be transferred to the beginning. Well, let's see how you would apply that advice to, say, that very sentence. <laughs> Here is the subject of the sentence. Here is the principal verb, and yes, they are interrupted by a phrase, indeed, a phrase that can be moved to the beginning of the sentence. So this is actually a rule that contradicts itself. <laughs> Third example, use the active voice. Often, uh, good advice, the examples that I gave from graduate student papers clearly overused the passive voice, but in illustrating uh, what that rule entails, they use the following examples of the passive voice. At dawn, the crowing of a rooster could be heard. Okay, that is an example of the passive. There were a great number of dead leaves lying on the ground. There is no passive construction in that sentence. It was not long before she was very sorry that she had said what she had. No passive in there. The reason that he left college was that his health became impaired. There is no passive construction in that sentence. So basically, Strunk and White score one out of four, 25%, in their own explanation of what it is that students should be avoiding. It's perhaps not surprising that uh, it's difficult to come away from this book, charming as it is, with usable advice on, to, on how to write. Well, why, uh, why we can do better today, in the 50 years since uh, Strunk and White uh, was published, indeed in the uh, 90 years since Strunk first put together his course notes, we have learned a great deal about how language works, from grammatical theory, from sociolinguistics, from experimental psycholinguistics, the study of sentence comprehension in the lab, and from cognitive science in general. And I'll just uh, introduce you to a, a few applications of this knowledge to the teaching of writing. First, correct usage. What exactly uh, do we mean when we say that a particular word or construction is correct or incorrect? Now, clearly, there is a fact of the matter. It's not a question of opinion, but it is a question of objective fact that there is no such word as misunderestimated, uh, that citizens of the proud nation of Greece are called Greeks, not Grecians and that divisive policies balkanize rather than vulcanize the country. To take just three examples from our former president, George W. Bush. Uh, <laughs> even former President Bush admitted in a self-deprecating speech that these were, uh, were incorrect. But what does it mean to say that they're incorrect? Incorrect in what sense? It is not the case that what is grammatically correct is decided by some official body, like uh, the Rules Commission of ba Major League Baseball. There is no Academy of the English Language. Nor is grammatical correctness an unchanging fact about the world, like the atomic number of gold, which can be empirically investigated. 
For all that, there is reality to grammatical uh, correctness. Namely, these are cases of evolving norms, just like other social norms that uh, sociologists and sociolinguists study, namely a tacit consensus at a given time among a standard community of writers and readers. So there is such a thing as grammatical consensus, but like other norms, they can change over time, and it is essential that one not confuse one, one's own pet peeves, especially as one ages and the language changes, starting from the, uh, the younger generations up, with any notion of objective correctness. Uh, a second example is grammatical uh, analysis. Why, why are the analyses in the elements of style so grammatically uh, inept? Well, I think there's very little application of what we know about how grammar works in uh, style manuals or in university curricula. Somehow the sense has gone, gotten out that grammar is uh, boring, it's like stamp collecting, it is just a, a taxonomy of different kinds of constructions, and uh, there is remarkably little systematic instruction as to how to analyze a sentence into its grammatical constituents. Now, in fact, the practice of linguistics shows that grammatical constructions are not just a taxonomy or arbitrary labels, but they involve uh, brain work. They are hypotheses that can be tested. Just to take an example, how do you distinguish a passive from an adjective? They often sound uh, identical, as in the Bob Dylan lyric, everybody must get stoned. Uh, the humor in that line comes from the fact that it has two grammatical analyses, but they can be distinguished. For example, an adverb such as very can only go with an adjective, not a passive. If you say everybody must get very stoned, it's no longer uh, um, ambiguous. It can't correspond to, they'll stone you when you're driving in your car, uh, and so on. The examples that uh, Strunk and White misanalyzed could easily have been correctly classified if you applied this uh, and other uh, tests. Uh, a third application comes from the cognitive processes engaged by sentence comprehension. What goes on in the mind as you try to make sense of a sentence or as you write one? Well. To put it crudely, writing consists of converting a network of ideas. You can think of it as a, a mind-wide web, a, a number of ideas uh, cross-referenced by links. On the other hand, when you have to output it as a uh, uh, snatch of language, you have to linearize it. You've got to get that multidimensional web out through the bottleneck of a serial channel. When a reader reads or a listener uh, listens, they have to do the process in reverse. That is, take a string of words and reconstruct the hierarchical grouping of words into phrases that corresponds to the hierarchical grouping of uh, ideas into bigger ideas and into still uh, bigger ideas. Uh, knowing that that is what sentence comprehension consists of can help uh, explain for example, why languages have active and passive constructions and when to use them instead of just memorizing the rule, passive, therefore bad. And any of us who have uh, endured bad copy editors are familiar with the copy editor who having internalized a particularly uh, robotic version of this rule simply converts every passive to an active, invariably making the prose much worse. To put it in the terms of uh, Noam Chomsky's famous distinction between deep structure and surface structure, active and passive sentences have the same deep structure, that is, semantic information about whom did who did what to whom, but a different surface order, that is, the linearization of those ideas into one word at a time uh, uh, comes in two different versions with different participants coming early in the sentence. That allows you to think intelligently about when to use a passive, namely the passive is the better construction when the affected entity ought to come earlier in the sentence, and there are a number of reasons why to mesh with the cognitive processes of a reader, you want to put some words early versus late, regardless of who did what to whom. So for example, when an entity is the topic of the preceding discourse, it ought to go first, and sometimes you need the passive voice in order to do it. This is a, a rather gruesome example that I got from the paper a, a couple of months ago. The dead included at least seven United Nation workers. Two of them had been uh, beheaded, Par forgive me for the example. There is a a passive, uh, and it's a good thing two of them had been beheaded because the 
topic of the preceding discourse was the uh, the murdered uh, workers, if you would put that in the active, as many copy editors would tell you to do, militants had beheaded two of them, that slows down uh, processing. Finally, and perhaps most important, there is a body of research in cognitive science, science sometimes called the theory of mind, a misleading term, because it does not refer to a scientific theory, but rather an intuitive or folk theory. The in theory of mind is the theory the tacit theory that every one of us has about the minds of other people. And in a famous demonstration, you can show that theory of mind or intuitive psychology is not fully functioning uh, until at least the age of four. Here's a little test that you could try if you've got a three-year-old handy. You put, uh, take a box of M&Ms and take out the M&Ms before the child comes in, put something else in the box like pencils. Give it to the child, Charles open, opens the box, and to his amazement, there aren't M&Ms inside, there are pencils. Okay, now you say to the child, okay, now, Jason is gonna come into the room now, and we're gonna give him this box. What does he think is in the box? And the three-year-old will say, pencils. They cannot entertain the possibility that someone else has a state of knowledge that is different from their own state of knowledge. Their theory of mind is not fully developed. Well, four-year-olds grow, grow out of this, sort of, but in reality, none of us really grows out of it. And uh, an equivalent of a failure of the false belief task in the context of adults is sometimes called the curse of knowledge. Namely, it's extraordinarily difficult for any of us to know what it is like for someone else not to know something that we know. Uh, this is, I would submit, the chief contributor to opaque writing, and I would add probably the chief contributor to bad teaching. A psychologist doesn't know what it's like not to know psychology, and a physicist doesn't know what it's like not to know physics, and so on. Uh, and in, uh, I think part of the cure is simply realizing that putting yourself in the shoes of your writer or uh, audience above and beyond any knowledge of grammatical technicalities might be the most important cognitive process in the crafting of clear uh, prose. To, su to sum up, I think uh, traditional instruction in writing has been based in large part on folklore, fallacies, and pet peeves. A modern understanding of language and cognition holds out the process to do better, including an understanding of what correct usage consists of, an analytic attitude to grammatical structure, an ability to anticipate and minimize the reader's uh, memory load, and an ability to put oneself in the state of knowledge of a potential uh, reader or audience. Thanks very much.